Hi y'all, you are about to watch a geometry video. This is chapter two, section five. And today we will be discussing postulates and two column proofs. Keep in mind that in your textbook they refer to the section as paragraph proofs, but I prefer to make my proof in a two column um, proof situation. And so I will teach you how to do that. And just as a side note, Make sure that anytime you're doing your homework in this section and it's asking for a paragraph proof and beyond, that we will actually be employing two column proofs, not paragraph proofs. So again, if the directions say write a paragraph proof, you are to read that as write a two column proof. Alrighty, so before we begin, we have a bunch of uh, postulates or axioms. And I wanna let you know that a postulate or an axiom is basically a statement that is accepted as true without proof which basically means you don't need to prove it. It's kind of like that we just take as fact and, and move on. And basically it's kind of like common sense in a way. You do that in language all the time. For example, um, you use lots of words to build sentences for um, definitions of other words. For example, um, no one really knows what the, what the letter or what the word A means or what the word the means. We know that they're articles, but we use the word the and a to write sentences all the time. Those sentences then basically define other words. So anyway, postulates and axioms, both the same kind of meaning. It's basically um, like a theorem, but something that we accept as fact. It's um, basic ideas, usually um, common sense stuff. So here we have a series of five of them. I'm going to go through them briefly, and um, you will put these in your notebook. It says uh, here we have postulate 2.1. Through any two points, there is exactly one line. And so we have that. So basically, any two points determine a line. 2.2, through any three non-collinear, the emphasis there being on this portion here, non-collinear, there is exactly one plane. So if you have three points that are collinear, then you can actually have more than one plane. But as long as those three points are non-collinear, then you will have exactly one plane. 2.3, a line contains at least two points. Um, so any two points, like in, theorem, like in the first postulate, 2.1, determine a line. But if you have um, more points on the line, of course, you could have more points on the line. But it will have at least two points. 2.4, a plane contains at least three non-collinear points, kind of similar to the previous one, where we know that we only need three points to make a plane, but you could obviously have more. 2.5, if two points lie in a plane, then the entire line containing those points lies in that plane. So basically in this case we see here that these two points A and point B are in plane K and because any two points determine a line, this line, line A, B or line M is entirely in plane K as well. So those are your um, postulates and axioms and we have a few more so I'm going to um, close this guy and then here we have a few others. We have 2.6, if two lines intersect then their intersection is exactly one point. This is very important for you not to read too much into it. It's not saying that two lines will always intersect because of course we know that two lines could in fact be parallel and then would never intersect. What it's saying is that if they intersect, they will do so in exactly one point. That's what it's saying there. Um, 2.7, very similar. It says if two planes intersect, then their intersection is a line. So when two planes intersect, we get an entire line. Think about also, we've mentioned this before in class, the floor and the wall and the edge that they meet at is basically that entire edge is like a line that is the intersection. But again, don't read more into it than it actually says. It's not saying that two planes will always intersect. It's just saying that if they intersect, they will do so in a line. Because again, we could have parallel planes. You can think of opposite walls in a room. Um, the floor and the ceiling are both planes and they'll, they'll never intersect. They're parallel planes. So if they're going to intersect, then their intersection is going to be a line. All right, so that takes care of that. So we're going to go to our first example here. And this example is in your textbook on page 128. I know that the, that the picture here, the image is kind of hard to see. So I just want to make sure that you can see it. I am going to go ahead and um, use my board here to um, highlight some things in case you can't see them in the diagram. 
but they want us to use this picture. So I have this line here that is kind of hard to see. So we're going to make it easier to see by using a bright color. I'm just going to kind of type over it. And hope that this works. Hopefully you can see that a little better, maybe not. Let's try to use this yellow that is going to work here. I've tried to use the same color that they have, but there's a line there. And then you have a bunch of lines here. And the other things that we can see from here are that this is called M, this is E, this is F, here we have B, P, A, C, D, T, S, Q, and G. Now again, you will probably find these um, diagrams easier to see in your book on page 128, but I want you to kind of have a general idea of what um, the diagram looks like. Okay, so it says, explain how the picture illustrates that each statement is true, then state the postulate that can be used to show that each statement is true. So the first thing I want to do right now is try to be able to, to help you learn how to look at a diagram and be able to extract information from it, because you're going to need that when you start writing proofs. So example one, it says part A, line M contains points F and G, point E can also be on line M. So we go to our diagram, we can see that here's line M, and it says points F and G. So line M contains points F and G, and you can tell that from the diagram because they are on the line. Point E, which is up here, can also be on line M. So you can see um, those uh, things from the diagram. So the edge of the building, is a straight line. So that's what you want to put here. Um, edge of building. Is a straight line. And we can go ahead and call that M. All right. And then we have points E, F, and G lie along this edge. Points E, F and G lie on this edge, the edge of the building, which we're calling line M. So they must be on line M. So points E, F, and G lie on this edge, and therefore on line M. All right? Um, and then the other thing that we have to do is state which postulate um, can be used to show that. And so you again, if you remember from the previous um, slide, we had a postulate 2.3 that said a line contains at least two points. So we want to put your postulate 2.3 because postulate 2.3 says that a line contains at least two points. And in this case, we found, though, that it has at least three points, E, F, and G. So that's how you do part A. So we'll try something similar with um, part B. It says lines S and T intersect at point D. Now, again, lines S and T are these smaller lines that are inside this triangular region here. So inside the triangle ABC, you have these smaller lines. You can barely see them there. But line S is this guy here, and line T is this guy here. So they're telling us that lines S and T intersect at point D. And of course, this is point D right here, so that's what this intersection is right there. Um, but again, it's kind of hard to see in the diagram what the actual building is. Um, but again, if you look in your book, it's basically um, a triangular like, like lattice thing that's on the roof of this building. It's like a window, if you will. So the lattice. on the window of the building is what we're looking at here. The lattice on the window of the building forms the intersecting lines. So 
we're just describing what parts of the of the image of the, of the diagram there are um, representative of the intersecting lines that we want to see here. And then we can see from the from the picture as well that lines S and T um, only intersect at point D. So the lattice in the window of the building forms the intersecting lines, which only they don't intersect more than once. They only intersect once at point D. So that's basically us explaining how the picture illustrates the statement. And then our next part is to actually say which postulate um, where you, we can use to um, prove this, basically. And the postulate we want to use is postulate 2.6, which said that if two lines intersect, then their intersection is exactly one point, in this case, point D. So we're going to go with postulate 2.6 for this guy. Postulate 2.6. Awesome. So there you have it. That's how you do example one. So we're going to let you try do it yourself, number one. So to do that, we need to clear this guy and close this little guy. Oops, oops. My bad. I need to bring up your um, do it yourself number two. So sorry about that. You can probably fast forward this as I'm just going to be back here at the computer trying to pull up the second one here. The do it yourself number one. Here we go. Sorry about that. But there is your do it yourself number one. It's the same um, image. It just has a different A and B. So once you've done that, we can move on to example two. Here we go. OK. So in example two, we're going to use postulates to explain our reasoning um, when analyzing statements. So here it says, determine whether each statement is always, sometimes, or never true. Explain your reasoning. So our first one says, if two coplanar lines intersect, if two coplanar lines intersect, then the point of intersection lies in the same plane as the two lines. So again, if two coplanar, coplanar means um, on the same plane. So if two lines are on the same plane and they happen to intersect, then the point of intersection lies in the same plane as the two lines. This is always true. Again, we're saying that, for example, we have a plane, and so here's a flat, the, the board can be a, a, a plane. So if I have two lines that are on this plane, and they happen to intersect, then their point of intersection, which is basically this point here, is also on the plane. I think that that makes sense. So um, for part A, we're going to say that it's always true. We also know the reasoning behind this is not just because I think that it looks cool, but if you look at postulate 2.5, it states that if two points lie in a plane, then the entire line containing those points is in that plane. So this point here is on the line, this point here is on the line, and since this point um, is on the line, then it also has to be in the plane since the entire line is in the plane. And so that's how we can also use postulate 2.5 to further prove that this is a true statement always. So our next one is part B. It says four points are non-collinear. This is sometimes true. I can give you an, an example here. We can say A, B, C, D, and we can put a point E maybe over here. And that can be an example of this one is sometimes true. It's not always true. So four points can be non-collinear like points A, B, C, E are non-collinear, but sometimes those points could be collinear, like A, B, C, D. And 
We have a postulate that says that they have to have at least a certain number of points, but that doesn't mean postulate 2.3 states that a line contains at least two points. Um, this means that a line can contain two or more points. It doesn't mean that it has to have only two points. It could have more than that. So yes, four points can be um, collinear, but they could also be non-collinear. So that's that little guy. So now we're going to have you try to do the same thing with do-it-yourself do number two. Um, tell me if it's always, sometimes, or never true, and explain your reasoning using um, the postulates. Alrighty? Um, so now that brings us to the, the gut, if you will, of our um, lesson today, and that is the proof writing. I'm not going to lie to you, a lot of students um, don't like proof writing. It can get very um, detail oriented, and if you skip you know, what you might consider a minor step, um, you'll still get it wrong, and, and it just kind of gets um, on people's nerves, I'm not going to lie. But um, hopefully I'll help you navigate through that process, and, and we can be um, somewhat successful here. So again, I want to tell you that we're not going to be employing the paragraph proof method. We're going to be using the two-column proof process. And so what you see on the board right now is what a two-column proof looks like. It's organized a lot better than a paragraph proof would be. A paragraph proof can get um, very wordy, um, and it's not always clear where the sentences or where the steps are. Um, you're just writing a bunch of um, sentences and making a paragraph, basically. But this way, you have a clear you know, step one, step two, step three, step four. Um, and then your reasons are organized on the right-hand side, your statements on the left-hand side. And so before we get started with an actual example, I want to just kind of show you what the steps are, more or less. Um, you're always given something so to prove. So like you'll always see either um, it'll say given, or in the actual problem, it'll tell you what's given, like what you already know um, is the given, okay? So there's always going to be a given statement, and it could be more than one given statement, but usually it's only one. And then they'll ask you for something to prove. So they'll say prove, or they'll say show that. And then when you show that something is true, you're basically being asked to prove it. So you have a given and you have something, something that you're supposed to prove. So how this works is you always want to start your proof with a given statement. So that should be like easy points for you to get because these two points should be automatic. I mentioned in class that you're always going to get two points per step because you're going to get one point for the statement and one point for the reason. And so the first step is always the easiest because the reason is always going to be given. You're always going to write here, it's given. All right, so you'll always put here the first step. And of course, when you say, when, right here, I don't have anything written down, but you'll see in our example in, in a second how that works. You'll have a given. So that step goes right here in step number one, and then you write given right next to it. So two points that you should not ever um, miss. The other point that you should never, the other two points, well not two points, but one point that you should never miss is the last step. The last step of your proof should always be what you were asked to prove in the first place. So it says here in step four, state what it is that you have proven. So when it says here prove A equals B, then your last step should be that A equals B. Otherwise, you never prove what you were supposed to prove. Okay? So you always want to start your, your proof with the given. Always want to end your proof with the proof statement. And on the reason side, of course, you'll always have the first one will be given. The last one will change. It'll depend on what you're proving. But one thing that you'll see here is this Helmos. And this is always extra credit on your proof writing process for you to remember to put it there. This Helmholtz is basically a little um, square, rectangular thing that's just kind of shaded in. Um, and it should always be placed at the bottom of your proof to the far right. Basically, it's indicating that your proof has finished. Um, this mathematician, uh, last name Helmholtz, um, started using that in this proof writing because he wanted people to know that he was done and not to keep going. And so he started using this Helmholtz and it kind of just became this thing where now we just call it a Helmholtz. Um, but anyway, so that's extra credit, you know, info for you. And that's why I put a plus one here because when you put that in your proof on a quiz or a test, then I will always give you a plus one point for that. So that should also help you with your proof writing process. So the part that gets ugly, not the beginning, not the end, is the part in the middle. So that's where you have to use deductive reasoning, which is like things like law of detachment, law of syllogism, um, that kind of stuff. Um, use deductive reasoning to form a logical chain of statements so it's like a chain of statements means that they have to be linked together. You can't just put things sporadically in different places. You have to follow the logical chain. So one step should lead to the next, should lead to the next, should lead to the next. So one of the questions you always want to be asking yourself is, 
is why are they telling me this? How does this, this step get me to the next step and to the next step and so on and so forth? Um, so you'll um, link those, those givens to what you are trying to prove. And while you do that, every time you put down a statement on the left, you'll have to justify that statement with the reason. Your reasons can be definitions, algebraic properties like reflexive property, transitive property, stuff like that. Postulates like the postulate 2.1 that we just talked about, 2.3, 2.4, all those postulates. And theorems that we will be proving as the year progresses. You're always going to be adding more theorems to your bank of theorems. So once you've proven a theorem, then you can use it to prove other theorems. So that's basically the flow of how the two-column proof process works. So I want to now show you, um, with example three, how you can write um, your own proof. We're going to start, obviously, like I mentioned in class earlier, with shorter proofs, and then eventually, as we get better at it, we'll get lo um, longer and longer proofs. So it says here in example three, given that M is the midpoint of segment XY, write a two-column proof to show that um, segment XM is congruent to segment MY. So I kind of drew a diagram here what that would kind of look like. Here's x, y, and they want to prove that m is the midpoint. So that's our, So now what I do is I take that statement and I write it in this format, given proof. I am given that m is the midpoint of x, y. So I have that there, and I'm being asked to prove this. Write a two-column proof to show that what? To show that x, m is congruent to m, y. So that's my proof statement. So already in my diagram, you can see that my first part is the given. That's why it's in red like we've had in the um, previous um, notes. M is the first given statement, so my reason is going to be automatically given. That's two points for me already, okay? My last step is going to be to prove what they asked me to prove, which is that XM is congruent to MY. So I put that in step three, and if I want to be smart about it here, I can even go ahead and add my Helmos over here in the far right bottom corner of my proof, that that's where it will finish. Now, what I need to do is connect my statements, my link. I need to have my logical link. So what does it mean? So when you have a create a logical link, you have to kind of ask yourself, what is it in step one that's going to help me to get to step two? If M is the midpoint of X, Y, what is the definition of a midpoint? The definition of a midpoint is that the two segments are equal to each other, that it basically cuts it into. So I have in my step two, X, M is equal to M, Y, and I can simply put here on step two, that is because of the definition of midpoint, all right? And so this is the part where I talk about in class where sometimes um, it's kind of technicality. You think, okay, I'm done. Well, you're not because saying something is equal to is not the exact same thing as saying that it's congruent. So you have to go one more step. So once we know that they're equal to, we can say that XM is congruent to MY by definition of congruence. So once we put that in there, now my proof is done. I have my given, I have my logical chain, and then I have my um, stating what I was asked to prove in the first place. My Helmholtz is there, so I'm good. So now what I need you to do is to try to prove this little guy. I've kind of helped you out um, by filling in how many steps you need. You don't need more steps than five. Um, but if you can't figure out what all those things are, there's some color coding here. We know that in this case we have two givens. So you have one given, then you need a link, and then you have another given, and then a link, and then you can get to your final answer. Um, of course, we will go over this in class if you don't quite get it all, but I just wanted to make sure that you had a, a headway there. So once you have completed that do-it-yourself question, then you will have completed your notes for this lesson, and I will see you in class, and thanks for watching.